study a little bit together today. Um, we have been studying the last few weeks about First Church, um, the simple church that Christ uh, intended to have whenever he said in Matthew 16 and 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So we're, we're just kind of going to finalize that, those thoughts today. Uh, somebody out there just said amen. So that's good. We can move on to something else. Uh, I have enjoyed looking back at the first century church and to see, you know, exactly what it was that was so important to Jesus Christ. Uh, that he said, I am going to nourish my church, I'm going to see that my church succeeds, and I'm going to do everything uh, that that church needs for me to do, for them to be a success. And so that's what we've been talking about, and how will be a part of that church. Uh, we've been rediscovering church, and that's what this whole series has been about. Here's what Jesus said in Ephesians 5, 29 and 30. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. In other words, Christ loves you guys. He wants to take care of you. He wants to feed you, and it's better than any steak and potatoes you've ever had. Is your involvement in his church and the way he feeds it and nourishes it, because it's his body, and we're all part of that body. And so that's kind of what we've been studying the last few weeks. And so I hope you'll get your uh, scriptures out. Turn over to Acts chapter 15. And, uh, and we want to read that. Actually, let's go to Acts chapter 22 first. Uh, Paul is one of the guys that uh, was a speaker. Uh, and he wrote a lot of the New Testament. And I want to start with this passage, I think, this morning. Because... Paul will refer to it a little bit later on. Uh, because when something happens in the church, uh, Paul has only one experience to flash back to that he brings to the table. Uh, when the church, Christ's church, gets to a point where they clash in some of their theology, they have a challenge at the church. They have a problem at the church. And that's what I want to talk about to conclude this whole series. What happens when there are challenges at your church? We're going to look at the first century church, but we're going to look at our church. What happens when there are challenges? Now, most of you know I have a brother, uh, Jay, who's two years older than I am. And on occasion, when we were growing up, every now and then, rare as it was, we would clash. And I can honestly say we never intentionally, we, well, let me back that up. We never aggressively, well, let me back that up. We never, we never hit each other in anger. We missed quite often, but we never actually made contact. Sometimes you get in conflicts at church, don't you? Sometimes you don't agree with everything that goes on. Sometimes there are things that you just got to work out. And, and hopefully we won't ever work it out in a violent way. So Paul is into the scene in Acts 15. We're going to go there in a second. But what he has to, to remind him of how to, how to handle this and how to read the Word of God and how to, how to proceed is found in his understanding of what it is to be a part of Christ's church. So here I want to read this for you just a second. This is Acts chapter 22, and we're going to start at verse 6. And... It's called the Damascus, Damascus Road Experience in a lot of people's uh, books. Actually, Paul told his story three different times because it was so impactful, so important for the first century church. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But I want to read just his conversion story, and then we'll get to what that is. Uh, this is the one in the middle, Acts 22, 6. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of whom I was, who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go to Damascus. And there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. 
It says, I could not see because of the brightness of the light. I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and I saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear the voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone uh, of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Okay, so Paul had this uh, incredible experience with the light and with Jesus Christ. And, and then Ananias taught him what he had to do to be saved. Now, if you back up a little bit to Acts chapter 15, you see why I'm bringing this to mind. There was a problem in the church. There were some challenges in the church. What had happened was people who were Jewish had that great tradition of being God's family. They had come into the church, and but, but they had brought with them the tradition of circumcision. Now the Gentiles, who Paul was out preaching to and starting churches everywhere, the Gentiles... They were being baptized into Christ also, and they were starting to merge together with those Jews. And the Jews for so many centuries had taught this circumcision thing is what marks the covenant. And this is how we know that he is our God and we are his people, all of us are circumcised. So they were saying to the, to the Gentiles, you guys need to go through this like we all have, and, and, and kind of that was their challenge. Now that's a whole big... Uh, Big ask there, isn't it? That was a big thing to ask of the Gentiles. So it was a big challenge. We're talking about salvation issues. And the Jews were trying to say something that wasn't a salvation issue, but they thought it was a salvation issue. And the Gentiles were unsure exactly what to do. So Paul said, let's have a discussion about it. So now we're going to read Acts chapter 15, 1 through 11. And this kind of gets the context of what I want to talk to you about for a few more minutes. By the way, we got to thank Brad and whoever was back there working on the computer stuff uh, because, I mean, I'm not the guy for that. But they do miracles back there, and we got the power going up. Otherwise, I'd just be sitting up here with nothing to say. Maybe not. Uh, I, I know very little about technology. I asked my grandkids uh, the other day. Of course, if you want to know something about the computer, you ask your grandkids, right? And, uh, and I, the question was, where is this cloud? I can't even find a cloud. And they had to tell me where the cloud was. So anyway, here we go. Acts 15. This is what we're going to talk about. Here we go. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with Paul and Barnabas, um, uh, Excuse me, had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles, to the elders, about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers, not believers, that means they're a part of the church who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order they keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Paul stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God knows who, uh, who's, uh, God knows the heart the God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. These are references back to the first Gentiles that became Christians. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the next disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just as they will. Okay, so there's the setting. You got it figured out. There's a challenge, and Paul is standing up and saying, wait a minute, 
there's something we need to, to agree on before we proceed through this. Here was the big discussion. Surgery for salvation. Anybody in here glad that that's not the case today? Hallelujah. Okay. What was really going on is that the Jews said, we don't know how many hoops we need these Gentiles to jump through so that they can be saved in the family of God like we understood that we have been. They want to say it's surgery for salvation. And yet the Gentiles, and Paul here speaking for them, is saying, wait a minute, they came into this relationship with Christ just like I did, just like you did. Now, I want you to notice some things about this discussion. Here were some things that did not happen, and that's what I want to talk about today. James said we should not make it difficult for those who are turning to God. Here's how they went about understanding that. Nobody said, I'm drawing a line in the sand. You've got to see it my way or it's the highway. Anybody ever had that said to you? Nobody said that in the first century church. They sat around. They had great debate. But nobody got angry and stomped out. And nobody said uh, or left to start their own church or to join another church. No other denomination out there that's going to be uh, doing what Christ wanted to do. So they said, let's, let's debate it. Let's talk about it together. But they said something a little more than that. And here's how they figured out how to handle the challenges in the church. Everyone simply returned to the teachings of Jesus. Now, if you want to follow along, look down a little further. Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others, they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. They agreed that if there's ever a challenge in the first church, in Christ's church, we're not going to put our hands up and say, talk to the hand, I'm leaving and taking my ball and going home. That didn't happen. They said, let's just go back to the word of the Lord. Now, I want to show you how they, uh, how they did that shortly after that. If you look at Mark chapter 1, 15, they're, they're first going to look at the, the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say about the salvation story? Book ends of Mark. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, he says, Repent and believe. And in Mark 16, 16, he closes the book by saying, Jesus saying, Whoever believes is baptized shall be saved. These are the words of the Lord. Look what Paul did with the words of the Lord later, right after chapter 15, where there was that big challenge in the church. Look what he did. Lydia was taught the words of the Lord and was baptized. That's what it says. And then Acts chapter 16, verse 32, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, that's the jailer, and he was baptized at once. They simply went back to the words of the Lord. And that's how they handled their challenges. Now, let me tell you a story. I have heard of a church that has had a conflict before. One of the conflicts that I've heard about is uh, songbooks. Look in your pew. Some of you have read songbooks, right? And I've told some of you this before. There was a church that I know of that they started debating what color songbooks they should have because they were getting a new auditorium and some new pews. Half of the church wanted red songbooks. The other half wanted blue. And so they began this conflict. And they got to being pretty violent about the conflict. And people started peeling off and leaving church because their side wasn't represented well or it was. So finally, they had a great decision to make, and they made it. We're going to have both. And every Sunday, we'll swap out the blue ones. The next Sunday, we'll have the red ones. The next Sunday, it was probably not the best way to solve that problem. If and when we ever have any problems, I'm sure we never will, right? If and when we do. Here's what I want to encourage us to do. Just go back to the words of Scripture and we can be unified. 
Because when you get away from Scripture, chaos happens. When you look back at the words of Christ, the words of God in Scripture, that's where unity comes. Christ's church was all about unity. By this, they will know that you're my disciples if you what? Have love for one another. So even when we disagree with things, we can still be unified. If we right now, today, disagree with who's supposed to wear a mask and who's not going to wear a mask, all right, we're going to have unity. Because we're, we're here taking care of our neighbors. We think about our neighbors first, so that'll kind of judge what we do. You know why we say that? Because it's in Scripture. We think about others in the church first. Now, looking back at the first century, there were other troubles to come. In fact, the Jews, uh, they, they had a hard time with the Christians, and, and the Romans, they had a hard time with the Christians, and, and everybody for a while, a little bit after this, started having troubles with the Christian folks. But the Christian folks were more unified than ever because they kept going back to the word of the Lord. Let me uh, repeat this. How did they decide? Surgery for salvation? Here, here's my secret ballot, okay? Secret ballot. Uh, they, they voted that down, okay? You can't see how I'm voting right now. I'm being politically correct, okay? And they said no surgery for salvation. But let me tell you that they were wrong. Okay, I've got a couple elders out here that started to pick up some rocks. I think I saw our tomatoes at least. If you look at Scripture, which is what we're going to do as a church, what we're always going to do as a church. In fact, if you're ever going to a church that doesn't go back to the words of the Lord for salvation issues especially, it's time to leave that church. But we're going to go back to the words of the Lord. And so when you go back to the words of the Lord and you talk about surgery for salvation, in the Old Testament they thought about this physical thing called surgery that was biologically going to happen to the men. And then Paul said, no, we, we don't need that. And everybody agreed because it was about faith in Jesus Christ and the baptism into Christ and all that. But if you look through Scripture, surgery for salvation is absolutely right. But let me tell you, it's just applied a little differently, even in the, the people of old thought about it. Look at this passage. Excuse me, we're going the wrong direction here. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. There's something that has, has to happen in the heart of every person so that you can love God perfectly and love others perfectly and, and live. Something You have to be circumcised of the heart. Is what this passage says. In fact, later on in Deuteronomy it says it. Leviticus says it a number of times. There's a certain circumcision of the heart that God says has got to happen. And now we go a little bit further. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through the faith. In the working of God, who raised him from the dead. All of a sudden, Paul is bringing circumcision into the New Testament picture and saying it's not something that somebody does to you biologically, physically. It's something that Christ does. He circumcises your heart. He cuts away the sin, and God calls on everyone to be circumcised by Christ, cutting away the sins from your life. There's another passage. It's, uh, I didn't put it on the screen. It's Romans chapter 2 and verse uh, 27, I believe it is. Here it is. Um, uh, 28. Let's see. Oh, chapter 2, 28. Sorry. And it says this. Um, I, I, I'm getting there. There it is. Somewhere. It's on the wrong page. For no one is a Jew, merely is one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward or physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. The circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not the letter of the old law. His praise is not from man, but from God. Here's the deal. i got to stand up for this one. 
when I read this in Levon earlier this week, I got chills. I've heard so often on the, on the television, on the radio, that baptism is just an outward sign of an inward grace. Boy, doesn't that sound smooth, sound sweet. The, the salvation has already happened. It's just a sign that you've already been saved. The problem is when you go back to Scripture and you talk about the circumcision that's done by Christ, done by the Holy Spirit, done by the workings of God, wait a minute, and it all happens wrapped up in the baptismal scene? How dare I minimalize that? God says in his word, Paul says it here, but in, the, in, in, in earlier passages it says, wait a minute, in this baptismal scene, when you finally give up, when you finally say, I'm done living my way because my way is not working, when you're finally saying, I'm going to die to myself and live for God, and you are systematically baptized saying, I give up, and they bury you in the water and you come up when you are baptized this is what scripture says that's when Christ the great physician works on you and cuts away the sin that's when the Holy Spirit is put in you to cleanse you of those sins and build on that into a holy righteous person all by the powerful workings of God wow how dare I minimalize baptism into Christ when the first century church read the passages from the Old Testament about circumcision, and now they understood these New Testament teachings from Paul and the others, they said, baptize me. I want Christ to circumcise me. I want the Spirit to move in and cleanse me and build me into a holy person because of the powerful workings of God. Is baptismal work? Absolutely, it's a work by God and the Holy Spirit and Christ at the same time. Ooh, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Some of us need to do a little more work. In fact, there are some people I believe who are baptized into Christ who don't really have a clue what they're doing. And maybe, just maybe, God had not circumcised their heart yet. Because they haven't died to themselves yet. That's why we don't only want to baptize those who understand who Jesus is and the sacrifice that he made and the dedicated life after that. Because we look at Scripture and we say, God, circumcise my heart. I give up. I want to identify with Christ in the death, burial, and resurrection. Make me clean. I give myself to you. And so the question of the day, surgery, salvation, yeah, yeah. Surgery by God Himself, the guy that said, "Here's how you're going to get it done." By Christ working on your heart, cutting free the sins, by the Spirit putting you back together and giving you new life in Christ. Circumcision, by, <laughs> surgery by, yeah. Circumcision was for salvation of the heart. I have one story to tell you in a minute. Calvin Chapman, friend of mine up in Faith, South Dakota. Uh, Faith, South Dakota is a town of 500 people way out in the middle of the prairie. And the church is a strong little church there. And uh, he said he was studying with a fellow one time uh, who came from some religious tradition. And he finally showed him about how important it is to all agree to come together and say, what does those scriptures say about the salvation issues especially? And the guy said, okay, I totally understand. I need to be born again, baptized in Christ. But I'm going to wait a while. I, I just think I need to wait a while and get some things right. And Calvin said, why, why are you waiting? He said, well, I've got some ducks. I've got some ducks that I need to get in a row. I need to get my life right. I need to do some things better, a more dedicated life, and, and some things I need to work on. I need to get my ducks in a row before I get my life to Christ. And Calvin, in his wisdom, said, what if you never get all your ducks in a row? Here's the truth. Until a person gives himself to Christ Jesus and is born again, the Spirit of God moves in, he will never get his ducks in a row. He will never be holy enough for God to accept him. He will never be pure enough to say, hey, I deserve to be in the church. 
until you totally dedicate yourself to saying, I'm dying to myself. And I'm taking on what God will give me through this rebirth process. That's story of conversion. And that's what the church, Christ's church, must always go back to. How can we just go back to the words of God? Have you ever disagreed with your spouse? Disagreed with a friend? Disagreed with your children? Disagreed with your grandchildren? No! There's the answer. You get two people in a room, they are not going to see everything the same. If God would have made us that way, life would really be boring, wouldn't it? But what he did say was, when you have disagreements, just go back to the Word of God. And when you all land there, chaos disappears and unity happens. That's the first church story. That's our church story. We just want to go back to what scriptures say and stay there, camp there, live there. That's how we continue to be unified in Christ. Let's pray together, church. Our Holy Father, we slowly put the pieces of the puzzle together. And we can't do anything but say thank you right now for your work that you have done to see us sanctified, set apart, saved. We thank you for the work that Jesus did on the cross, sacrificing for us, carrying our sins to the cross. We thank you for the work of the Spirit that happens at the baptism scene, also where we are infused with the Spirit, your Spirit, and cleanse of sin and give a new life. Father, as we want to be the church that Christ established, give us wisdom to go back to your word and have you in Help us, Father, to have the wisdom to know the challenges ahead and use your wisdom to solve those challenges. And Father, thank you so much for the challenges and make us stronger and more unified when we come through it as your church. Father, thank you so much again for Christ and what he means to our life. It's through him that we pray. Amen. God bless you today, everybody. Thanks for being here. Let's stand and sing a song of encouragement.